Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the uh, 15th annual Shannon Memorial Lecture. Uh, we're delighted to have uh, Professor David Say of Stanford University here to speak with us today. And I would like to uh, begin by telling you a few things about uh, David's already storied career. So we usually begin the lecture by acknowledging Jack Wolf, who really established this lecture series uh, 15 years ago. And uh, he's the one who had the, the vision to set this up and to make it a, uh, an annual event here at UCSD. So thanks to Jack. So here's a brief summary of David's uh, career. So he has a number of interests. I think it's fair to say that his primary interest is in information theory, but with a wide range of, of applications. I think primarily uh, he's known for his work in uh, wireless communications, but more recently he's done a lot of work in computational biology and machine learning uh, as well. Uh, as you can see from the slide, he uh, got his Bachelor's of Arts and Science in Systems Design Engineering, which I think is very appropriate because he sort of has pioneered a systems-oriented view of wireless communication networks uh, from Waterloo. He got his master's and PhD from MIT, and then went on to positions at uh, Bell Labs, where he was a postdoctoral researcher, and then on to UC Berkeley, where he was a faculty member for many years. And then more recently, he joined Stanford University, where he's the Thomas Kailath and Guanghuan Zhu professor. So David has received numerous awards. I'm actually going to start, I want you to read this slide from the bottom up. So he started out with an NSF career award, which as you know is given to young faculty members early in their career to get them launched. He then uh, shortly after received the Erlang Prize from the Applied Probability Society for outstanding contributions to applied probability by a young researcher. Uh, he was named an IEEE Fellow in 2009, among the youngest uh, to receive that award. And then in 2012, he was named to be a Gilbreth Lecturer by the National Academy of Engineering, which is uh, given to recognize an outstanding young American engineer. So he's managed to stay young over this span of <laughs> almost 15 years. And <laughs> Uh, most recently, he was uh, given the, the uh, highest honor from the Information Theory Society, which is the Claude e. Shannon Award, and I think it's fair to say he is among the youngest to receive that. So I, I think the, the key message here is that David has a certain energy and youth that seems to be sort of not ending, and I think that really informs his research and gives him a fresh outlook on things. If you haven't um, done so already, or if you weren't lucky enough to be there uh, when he gave his uh, Shannon lecture, I really strongly encourage you to look at the, the YouTube video of his presentation, The Spirit of Information Theory. It's really a wonderful, wonderful presentation. So turning to his research, to which he brings this uh, youthful outlook, I'm just listing here some of his most well-known papers, uh, if ones for which he's received awards, you can see that he uh, received just in 2015 the award that the IEEE Communication Society and Information Theory Society give to a paper that is relevant to both, to both fields. Uh, and then he received the uh, Stephen O. Price paper award from the IEEE Communication Society in 2013. Now here you may think that I have a cut and paste error when I was making the slide, but it's not the case. He actually also won the COMSOC, ITSOC Joint Paper Award in 2013, and he received an award from the IEEE Signal Processing Society in 2012. So you can see that his research kind of has impact in multiple areas, but there were so many of these paper awards I couldn't fit them on one slide. So here's the second slide. So he received the EURICIP Best Paper Award in 2012, and in fact, the Information Theory Society Paper Award in 2003. And now here you're probably very sure that I made a cut and paste error, but it's not the case. He also got the COMSOC, ITSOC Paper Award back in 2001. 
His publications have been enormously influential. Um, if you look at uh, Google Scholar, you'll see that his writings have garnered almost 60,000 citations, which is pretty amazing. I think that might be a record among all of our Shannon Memorial lecturers, by the way. I'm not sure anybody has gotten more than that. But there's another way in which his work has really had a huge impact, and that is through his inventions. And so David is known as an inventor of the proportional fair scheduling algorithm, which was developed while he was visiting at Qualcomm and is used in essentially all of the third and fourth generation wireless networks. And if you thought that 56,689 citations is impressive, then you'll really be impressed by the number of users of his invention, which is now probably about 2.7 billion and growing daily. <laughs> oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> it went up by a factor of 10 since I made the slide. <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> okay, so David's also known for his, uh, his uh, teaching abilities, his ability to inform people about the beauty of information theory and communication theory. And so he's received recognition for that as well. I've listed here a couple of the awards he's received, but many of you are probably aware of, of his book, Fundamentals of Wireless Communication, that is kind of a bestseller in that area and is used by, I'm not sure how many uh, programs, probably close to 100 now university programs uh, published in, uh, 2005, and it, it basically has been the, the, uh, the Bible for generations of, of uh, researchers and practitioners in wireless communication. So with that, I'm very happy to uh, introduce David to all of you, and he's going to talk about understanding generative adversarial networks. David. So uh, this is recent work we've done, and this is joint work with uh, my postdoc, Sohei Feizi, Chan Ho Su, uh, my former student now visiting me, and Fei Sha, a student at Stanford. And I would like to thank particularly Sohei, which is the first author of this paper, and also did helped me a lot in preparing this talk. Okay? So, uh, the title is Understanding G Generative Adversarial Networks, so-called GANs. So, uh, this talk is a bit odd talk, because the Shannon Memorial Lecture is about tradition. We have a long tradition here. GANs is uh, something invented two years ago, three years ago, less than three years ago. So it's uh, modern. So this talk is about what happens when tradition meets fashion. Okay? Uh, in fact, uh, GANs, you, there's almost a paper out every day. And in fact, uh, uh, someone told me that uh, there's a talk in one hour uh, on this topic. That's Sorry? Galen Nitra, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Galen Nitra. <laughs> no, I'm not I'm not, I haven't moved that far away. <laughs> All right. Um, before I talk about GANs, let me talk a bit about uh, information theory about Shannon. So, a little bit of history. So, uh, Shannon came in 1948 with this uh, astounding paper. But actually, before then, communication has been going on for over 100 years. So what happened was that in the, in the 18th, 19th century, different types of communication systems have been built, from telegraph, telephone, radio, and television. And at that time, communication design was a very separate thing. In other words, different systems have very different communication design tied to the details of the specific source and specific communication media. So, the, one of the main contributions of Shannon is really to this picture, which is one unified framework that connects everything. So, instead of solving the problem for each different communication system, you solve one problem, and you understand this one problem, and you can apply this to many, many different types of communication systems. And this is the famous figure one of the 1948 paper. Um, so, based on this picture, the world has changed. 
significantly for the past 60 or 70 years. Many, many communication systems were built. In fact, all communication systems built, almost all, are built on basically the principles of Shannon. Uh, so that's an astounding history. Today, though, I'm not going to focus that much on that history. I'm going to say something a bit different. Is sort of the research philosophy of information theory, the philosophy behind this figure. So let me say a few words about that. And I would like to summarize this philosophy as simplifying to unify. So to understand what this means, uh, the best person uh, we should get uh, information from is, of course, Shannon. So Shannon, in 1952, he wrote, he had a lecture to Bell Labs researchers on his uh, insight on creative thinking. So he says the following. Suppose you're given a problem to solve. A very powerful approach to this is to attempt to eliminate everything from the problem except the essentials. You may have simplified now to a point that it doesn't even resemble the problem that you started with. But very often, if you can solve this simple problem, you can add refinements to the solution of this until you get back to the solution of the one you started with. OK. So if you look at this, then this is basically the essence of his thinking. In some sense, how he got that grand unification. Because if you look at the original communication systems, the television, the radio, etc., it looks completely different from this simple figure one that he drew. But yet, that captures the essence of the problem, the essential of the problem. And so that's what I call simplify to unify. You remove a lot of details of the specific communication systems, you keep the essence, and you have just one figure. Now, once you unify, once you unify, there is opportunity to further simplify. OK? Uh, to give an example that is probably well known at UCSD, uh, we have a communication system. There's a thing called channel noise, source of noise in figure one. Uh, that is the channel model. And now you can ask the question, what is the simplest possible model to look at the problem? So you're now within a unified framework. You have a general model. And now you specialize further to a simplified model. And the simple model here is the BSC. How much simpler can you get to the BSC? It turns out, actually, you can get it even simpler. So people realized about 20 years ago that actually the problem of coding, for example, can be looked at even simpler in the binary erasure channel. So this example showed us that even the notion of what is simple is not completely trivial. It takes years of experience of working on a problem or working on a set of problems before one sort of understands, hey, you know, this model it's actually even simpler, but yet still captures the essence of the problem. So that's what I want to talk about today, which is this uh, philosophy of unification and simplification sort of iteratively. And I think that sort of captures, to me, the philosophy of research in information theory. And I would like to ask the question, which is, can I apply this philosophy in domains other than communication? And so today, I'm hoping to use this example of GANs, not Gallian Asenite, but Generative Adversarial Network, to convince you that indeed this philosophy, although very old now, 80 years, 70 years, still relevant today. OK, so what is the problem that GANs is trying to solve? This is uh, actually, this problem is also a very age old problem which is learning generative model, which means you are given observed data. And you want to find a probabilistic model to generate new data, which looks statistically like the observed data. This is the problem. It's the age-old problem in statistics. But this problem has received a facelift in the past three years by this guy, Goodfellow, who invented this concept of generative adversarial network. So in a NIPS paper in 2014, he came up with this architecture of learning generative model. And this is the architecture. So here's the data. I use y1 up to yn to denote the data that you observe. And now you have a source of randomness that you generate yourself, x1 up to xn. 
and you have a generator which takes this randomness. For example, there could be uniform random variables or Gaussian random variables with normal, with mean zero, covariance identity. And you generate a bunch of fake data which you try to imitate these real data. And then he posed the problem of learning as a game between the generator and a discriminator. And the goal of this discriminator is trying to tell the fake data and the real data apart, whereas the generator is trying to make the fake data as close to the data as possible to fool the discriminator. So you formulate this problem as a game, and hopefully at the equilibrium of this game, the generator will get so good that the fake data cannot be discriminated anymore from the fake, from the real data. Okay? So this is a very interesting architecture, I think. It is uh, intuitively appealing. Moreover, you can uh, exploit the fact that we have very good nowadays functional approximation boxes, which are basically neural networks, to implement these generators and discriminators. Okay? So it is a way for them to leverage uh, basic deep learning. And uh, so the discriminator here is shown in D. So basically the discriminator is trying to calculate some kind of log loss. And you can think of this number as measuring how different the real data and the fake data is. The larger this number is, the bigger the difference. And so the discriminator is trying to maximize this function, sum over all the data, real and fake, and it's trying to maximize this difference. The larger this difference is, the more you can tell the difference between these two data. At the same time, the generator is trying to minimize this discriminability. And this is the game, min-max game, and this is so-called GAN's game theoretic optimization. Okay? And, and I'm going to use a little bit of notation here so this is a technical talk. I'm going to use a bit notation here to replace this summation by an expectation over the empirical distribution. So whenever I write QY or QY hat, this refers to basically the empirical distribution you, get, you collect by getting these data, the histogram of these data, so to speak. Okay? So the expectation is basically nothing but a fancy way of writing a sum. But a sum is too long, so I just write the expectation. Okay? All right. Is this clear? By the way, this notation is kind of important. So if there's any question about this notation, I would like to answer it now. Okay? All right. So this is the optimization problem, the game theoretic optimization problem. And G and D are in certain classes. And in the GANS formulation, these are usually implemented by deep neural networks. Okay? All right. So this is the formulation. And GANS has received a lot of attention in the past three years. If you go to NIPS, there are sessions after sessions, posters after posters on GANS. And, and a lot of them are applications. So GANS is really quite powerful in terms of generating images, for example. Images are a very common domain for GANS. So you learn from these images. Now you're given an image where parts is gone, and your generative model is able to complete the rest. Okay? Uh, you can also do things like text to images to generate typical images from the text. Uh, you can also do image interpolation and you learn and then you can interpolate. You can also help robot navigate by basically knowing what's the typical safe images and now compare it with the actual image the robot see and figure out that hey it looks different. I'm in a danger zone. And this allows the robot to learn without too much negative images. Now think about it. If the robot has to learn from negative images, then you need a lot of robots, <laughs> basically, because negative images means like things are screwed up. So this is a way for you to learn from only po mainly only positive images. Okay? So many other applications as well. So it's a very exciting field. As I said, papers are written on a daily basis. Okay? Very exciting and very uh, nerve-wracking field because you're working on something and then who knows, tomorrow there may be a paper on archive already uh, describing your work. Hopefully it's not describing your work, but uh, describing work similar to yours. All right, 
However, from a uh, technological point of view, GANs is actually uh, have certain issues that people noticed. So training GANs turns out to be quite challenging. You need a lot of experience and expertise in training these GANs because this is not training one neural network. This is training basically two neural network competing with each other. So it's a kind of a strange uh, training problem and people notice that the complexity with convergence and dynamics. There's something called mode collapse which means that if you don't train it well, you end up generating very boring images which is basically one of a few images only. And you never get a diversity of image from your distribution which is what you want. Uh, stability issues, uh, etc. And generalization, people observe, could be also poor. That means that you need a lot of data before you can get to uh, good results. And often the performance evaluation is often subjective, like you look at those images, they look pretty good, and that's an evaluation. So, uh, because of all these factors, then people start tweaking the basic Goodfellow architecture, and um, these are the architectures that have been generated in the past two and a half years. Uh, these are just some examples, just some examples. So, you have a, so here's the situation. You have a very exciting new technology. Um, there seems to be some, is implementation is not, not trivial. Many, many variation on the architecture. So this seems to remind us that, you know, maybe one should sort of think a little bit about the conceptual foundation of this technology and whether we can understand it better. And uh, so we go back to our picture. Unify and simplify. So right now we have, I don't know, 15, 20 architectures. Can we sort of somehow unify them? Can we come up with a unified formulation for GANs? So in particular, in machine learning, typically when you formulate a machine learning problem like a supervised learning problem, you start with a loss function. And you want to say that your machine learning algorithm optimizes for this particular loss function. In GANs, actually it's not very clear what the loss function is for different architecture. So our goal number one is to try to come up with this formulation for general loss function. And second, once we have a unified framework, then we can start asking the question, which is, can we identify the binary erasure channel for GANs? What is the simplest possible case we can look at to get a complete understanding of the operation, the behavior of GANs, and how we can improve GANs? Okay? So that's what I try to accomplish today these two goals, okay? Um, all right, so let's start with the first one, which is formulating GANs, all right? So what do I mean by formulating GANs? So let's see what we have here. So what are we given? We're given data, y1 up to yn, okay? The data drawn from some distribution, py, which is unknown. I have available to me some randomness I generate from some distribution px, which I do know, say normal zero identity. Okay, I have a class of generator at my disposal, neural networks, etc. All right, so this is given in the problem. Now, what's my goal? My goal is to find a generator G in this class script G, so that if I now draw another random draw from the randomness X, that the output G X looks like an image that comes from the real data, real distribution. So that means G U X should be similar to Y in distribution. In distribution. Now, of course, you cannot prove theorems when you have this kind of like double tilde and triple tilde and so forth, right? So at this point, we don't have a formulation. We don't have a mathematical formulation. We don't have intuition of what we want to accomplish. So therefore, the question is, how do we formulate this precisely? Okay. Now, if you think about this problem then you should we should think about broader, about machine learning, about what's the connection of this problem to other problems in machine learning. In particular, really, what type of problem is that, this? So I want to argue this is actually an unsupervised learning problem. Think about a robot example. You want to generate images that looks like a safe environment by looking at only positive example of safe environment. So in other words, we don't have positive and negative examples. We only have positive examples. And we want to generate what's the typical safe environment image would look like. Right? So that's an unsupervised learning problem. No labels. 
So these YIs have no labels. No one tells you what they are. Okay? No one tells you whether an image, they're all basically safe. Okay? So it's an unsupervised learning problem. So basically we're trying to formulate the GANs problem, which is an unsupervised learning problem. So to get some help, to get some help, we should look at a neighboring problem. Okay, so what's a neighboring problem for unsupervised learning problem? For which there is a precisely known, well-established mathematical formulation. Sorry? Reinforcement. Reinforcement learning. That's a bit too far away. <laughs> no, actually, unsupervised learning, of course, the simple, simple problem is supervised learning. <laughs> Sorry, supervised learning. See, people are thinking very far away now. Maybe next talk I will be reinforcement learning. All right. But this one, supervised learning. So supervised learning, what's the problem? So now I am given pairs x1, y1, x2, y2, xn, yn. And y1 is the label of the feature vector x1. Okay? So this could be um, label data, pairs, drawn from some distribution pxy unknown. I have a class of predictor. I have a class of predictor. For example, it could be linear predictor or neural network predictor. And now my goal is to find a good predictor in this class such that if you give me a new sample, unseen sample, with a feature vector x, then I could produce for you gx, which is close to the actual but unknown target variable y. Okay? So is this clear that this is a supervised learning problem? Are people okay with this concept, supervised learning? Okay. So this is one of the most basic problems in machine learning. Now, the good thing about this problem, as opposed to this problem, is that there's a very standard ma mathematical formulation. The standard mathematical formulation is as follows. You first specify a loss function L. Okay, that measures uh, loss. And then you minimize over all G in script G, which is the, what I mean here, the sum of the losses across all your examples. Okay, so this is a loss. This is yi, your real labels. Gxi is your prediction. So this is a prediction loss on the data, on the examples. And you sum it up to get an average empirical loss. So this is the so-called empirical risk minimization framework, a stand very, very standard framework in machine learning, the dominating framework. So when you train a neural network, that's what you're doing. You're minimizing some kind of loss across all neural network predictor, G, over your samples. Okay? And all the methods that people do is trying to approximate how to minimize this. Okay? So this is the formulation that is the starting point of supervised learning. Okay, so now what I want to do is I want to see if I can borrow from these set of ideas to come up with a formulation for unsupervised learning. Okay? Now the first observation I want to make to convince you that there is such a connection possible is that we no you notice one observation is that G star, that is the optimal solution of this, actually also solves an unsupervised learning problem. Now this is a bit puzzling. But if you look at what G achieves, what does G achieve? It achieves Gx is close to Y in value. But what I want to achieve for unsupervised learning is that Gx is close in distribution to Y. Intuitively, if you're close to Y, then you're also close in distribution of Y. So in a sense, the supervised learning and supervised learning problem is a harder problem. If I could solve that, then I could solve this. Okay? So, now putting on sort of uh, computer science thinking, we can do a reduction. And the reduction is to reduce a, this problem to this problem. And then by the reduction, we can do a formulation for this problem. So that's what we're going to do. So the reduction is from unsupervised supervised. So I start with a supervised learner. So I, this box is the supervised learner that I described earlier. I give you a loss function L, and the input is a bunch of data sam examples. The output is my optimal predictor. Okay? 
I have, inside this box, I will be solving some kind of empirical risk minimization problem. I don't care at this point. It's just a box for me. Input examples, output the predictor. Now, what do I want to build? I want to build a gun under a loss L. So here's the key here. I'm bringing in a particular loss L, and I want to define what a gun under loss L means. So the input is a bunch of data and also a bunch of generated randomness. Okay? And now what I want to do is to somehow take this input, transform it into this input, plug it into this box, outcomes G star, which I can use for my unsupervised learning problem. Okay? So this is a reduction. Because I have a box, and now I want to build a bigger box. So how do I now take this stuff and connect it to this stuff? Well, there's an obvious way. I can just pair up these x1 to y1, x2 to y2, xn to yn. So there's a coupling. And then I have pairs, and I can fit it into this guy. And now I have a formulation. And now I have an overall GANs under the loss L. Now, if you look at this, you should think there's something very fishy going on here. Because this is my generated randomness. This is my data. The index is not meaningful. The fact that uh, this is my first generated randomness and this is my first sample is not meaningful. So this pairing or this coupling is not a meaningful coupling. In fact, I could try another coupling. And I would generate another set of exam training examples for the supervised learner. OK? So what should I do? Well. So let's see what I should do. So now open this box. And this is my loss. This is my loss. Under this set of examples. And I can pair it in any way I want. So in other words, for every pairing, I get a supervised learning problem. Which supervised learning problem should I solve? Should I make life easier for me, for myself? or harder for myself. I don't know about you, but I'm kind of like, Paul was saying I'm young and so forth. I'm not really that young. So I don't want to make life harder than necessary for myself. So I want to make it easier for myself. Because you know, this box, this pie, I can control. I can couple whatever way I want. So why don't I choose the coupling to minimize this loss? So that's my formulation. The formulation is the following. I'm giving a bunch of data and a bunch of randomness sampling. And now I choose the pi to minimize the empirical loss over all g. So I'm solving the easiest supervised learning problem. And that's the reduction. OK? So I have a complete formulation now, because now I can have an optimization problem given a loss function l. And I solve this optimization problem. So this is the optimization formulation for guns. Now, there's a little bit more. If you notice that this pi is a coupling, but more generally, you can actually couple stuff in a probabilistic way. So you can put this into a joint distribution. So randomize the coupling. Now you can show that if you have n guys here, as before, and n guys here, this Joint coupling is not meaningful. Deterministic is fine. You can show that. However, actually, there's no reason why the generated randomness should be exactly the same number as the data, because you can generate however many samples you want. In, so in general, you would like to do some kind of probabilistic coupling. And so the problem is now you can minimize over all joint distribution. So this is the formulation. Now, at this point, I want to take a little bit of a break and ask ourselves, well, is this connection new or old? Now, supervised learning is very old. Supervised learning is like 300 years old. Okay? It starts with people like Gauss and so forth. You know, they do supervised learning. They don't call themselves supervised learning, but that's what they did. And supervised learning is also pretty old. So what's going on? Am I making a connection here, 2017? So let's see what's going on. So the reason why I don't think anyone has come with this connection is the following. 
in supervised learning, typically the notation is that you have a feature vector x and you have a label y, right? So this is a supervised learning problem. Each data item has a feature vector x and a label y. In unsupervised learning, people always try to draw a connection to supervised learning. There's no reason, there's no, it's obvious why people want to do that, because supervised learning is much more familiar, so people like to draw a connection to supervised learning. And the classical connection is that you have feature vector x, but the label is removed, so you have no label. That's typically how people think of supervised learning, unsupervised learning. As supervised learning, but without the label. But what do we do here? We are connecting in a different way. We are saying we have the label y, but we lost the feature vector x. And so I'm creating a supervised learning problem by providing with you with that x. And I'm allowed to optimize over the easiest unsupervised learning, supervised learning problem. And that's why, if you look at our notation for GANs, our notation is actually for people familiar with GANs work, or any unsupervised learning work, we are not using x to represent the data. That's a typical notation. We'll use y to represent the data. OK? All right. And uh, so now we have a formulation. We go back to our formulation. We have a generator class G, a loss function L. We have the data. We have the randomness. So I'm just summarizing everything in terms of the empirical distribution now, instead of the sequence of vectors. Okay. And we're solving this optimization problem the same one as I wrote here. So I have a double minimization, minimize over all joint distribution and over all generators. And now I introduce uh, the fake data. So y hat is the output of the generator, so it's fake. y hat is the fake data. And then I can rewrite this minimization in terms of minimizing generator first and then minimize over all joint distribution between y and y hat before it was x and y. y and y has the same thing. And I get this form, okay? So this is the expected loss, empirical loss between y and y hat minimized over all possible coupling between y and y hat. So I'm giving you the marginal distribution qy and the marginal distribution qx, which induces a marginal distribution qy hat, you are allowed to couple in any way to make the supervised learning problem easier. And this is optimization, okay? Double optimization. Now, the advantage of writing this form is it connects to another branch of mathematics. Because there is a branch of mathematics which study this quantity. And this optimization problem is a so-called optimal transport problem. So it's invented by a French mathematician, Monge, and, uh, but a lot of important work is done by the Russian mathematician, Kontorovich, who actually won the Nobel Prize in part due to this kind of work. Okay. Uh, what is this problem? Okay. You are fixing a marginal distribution QY. You're fixing a margin distribution qy hat. The joint distribution is a coupling. So you can think of is that coupling is a way for you to transport stuff from one point to another point. And the cost is given by this function L. So it's an optimal transport problem. Moving stuff, so you have a distribution of stuff, you have a distribution of stuff here, you want to move the stuff, and the movement costs you a cost L. Okay? So uh, Villani, our friend Villani, who we invited to ISIT, but uh, never showed up. He's an expert in this area. In fact, he wrote a 900-page book. In fact, I was thinking maybe if he showed up, he would have told us the story, and then I wouldn't have to do my research. But uh, he didn't show up, so we don't know what he was going to say. Sorry. You know, when people don't show up, it's not very polite, so I thought I would just point it out. <laughs> All right. OK. All right. So this is a problem. And uh, this problem has a very long history, a lot of connection to much, a lot of mathematics. And it now comes up very naturally to our problem of reducing supervised to unsupervised. OK. Now you say, wait a minute, this guy, David Shea, he completely forgot about the GANs. He went on and do all kinds of math. And now what's going on? Did he forget about GANs? No. 
No. It turns out this is very related to guns. And, but to see the connection between this stuff and guns, you have to look at a formulation of the optimal transport problem in terms of its dual. So if you look at the problem in the optimal transport problem, which is inside, what is actually this problem? And how did, why did Kotorovich won a Nobel Prize for this problem? If you look at this problem, this is actually a problem of linear programming. Because the expectation is a linear function of the joint distribution, and the marginal are linear constraints. They're just tying you the boundary values up. So this is a linear programming problem. And in fact, Kotorovich did a lot of fundamental work in linear programming basically to understand this problem. And as we all know from optimization, every linear problem has a dual. And because there's no duality gap because it's a linear programming. And so if you look at the dual, which is now in maximization, it is of the following form over this function class, so-called L-convex, and over this kind of dual function. The details does not really bothering us, because we're going to go to a very specific example very soon. But what I want to write up is that there's a very famous dual to this LP by Kontorovich, the so-called Kontorovich dual. And this dual is an optimization. So therefore, Gans comes back up. Because now we have a generator minimizing outside and a discriminator passing through the data through a function psi and fake data through a function psi L. And this discriminator is trying to maximize the difference and this generator is trying to minimize the difference. So we can see that actually Gans, although invented by some guy who is 20 odd years old, he did not know that he was actually touching a point, a branch of mathematics that is two or three hundred years old. Quite amazing, actually. And um, I would like to also contrast this with some other work who try to come up with a unified formulation. Very recent work, by the way. Guns, all, pap all papers and guns are very recent. It's usually like six months ago, it's already not so recent, you know. It's a pretty fast field. Uh, so the formulation by Liu works on the dual. So you can think of that the dual is actually trying to look at this discriminator. And you can try to have a general theory of all class of discriminator minimize. But I claim that this is not quite the right approach to this problem. The right approach should start with the primal and specify the loss function through the primal because that is actually a supervised learning problem for which the specification of loss function is a standard and well defined. And this bridge gives us the specification to the unsupervised learning and the duality gives us the, archi the computational architecture. I believe this is the right way of looking at Gantt. In fact, if you look at uh, Goodfellow original architecture, you will see that he has this objective, and you can show, in fact, uh, whereas optimal transport gas have this objective. They look different. And in fact, the primal problem of this problem is minimizing so-called the Shannon, Jensen, Jensen, Shannon. In the, I always start with Shannon first because uh, Jensen, Shannon divergence. Uh, the bad thing about this divergence is that it's not continuous. And this transport distance is continuous. That means that if you have something converging weakly, this will converge to zero as well, but not this. And in fact, our work was very much motivated by a very important paper at the beginning of this year by Ajowski and L, which introduces Washington guns. This is one of the 15 architectures that I listed in the beginning where they proposed that we should solve this optimization problem. If you look at this optimization problem, okay, it is a special case of our general formulation for with this loss. So what is this loss? It is taking a vector y minus y hat, taking the Euclidean norm of this vector. This is the loss. Okay? 
Now, they called us, in fact, the name is called a Washington 1 distance, W1. They propose it as a way to get around the discontinuity of the Jensen Shannon divergence. And they use this to design a new gas which have a better property. What we did was we think, look at this thing and we reverse engineer it and we realize that actually this, that this way of looking at things is the right way of looking at things. Not because, not only because it's continuous, but also because it is actually intimately tied to the supervised learning problem and allowing us to generalize this to arbitrary loss instead of just the Euclidean loss. Okay? So that's the end of the story of the formulation. But now we go back to our picture. And now that we have a unified formulation, then a natural question at this point is, where is the binary erasure channel? In other words, what is the simplest possible loss we should be looking at? Is it the Washington W1 loss or is it a different loss? What is the simplest model we should apply this technology to learn? And maybe we can say something quantitative about the behavior of guns on the simplest model. Okay? All right. So at this point, you should answer these two questions. But to allow you to answer these two questions, I will give you a hint. And the hint consists of four people, four giants. Four giants. Okay. Starting from the left, we have Landrange, Gauss, Wiener, and Kalman. The four people, their contribution have one thing in common, and that would determine what is the simplest loss to look at. What's the simplest loss to look at according to these giants? The quadratic loss. Okay? And what's the simplest model to look at? The Gaussian model. Okay? So we're going to study the Gaussian formulation for this particular case and see whether we can prove some theorems about it. All right, so we have the quadratic Gaussian. The loss function is the Euclidean distance square. Now, this square, although it's just one number two here, it makes a lot of difference, okay? A lot of difference. And the primal problem is I uh, write down as this. Minimize the expected square error over all joint distribution between y and y hat. And this is a W2 square, so-called, between QY, the data from the true distribution, QY hat, the generated data from my, my generator, and I want to choose the generator to minimize this W2 distance. The dual can be worked out to be of this form. Okay, so now we have psi to be a convex function, and psi star is just the convex conjugate of this function. So the W2 theory becomes a convex theory. Okay? All right, so this is the quadratic Gaussian architecture. You have a generator here, and then you have a discriminator here. The discriminator tries to minim maximize the difference. The generator tries to minimize the difference. Okay? So the Gaussian setup, we want to now apply this architecture on the Gaussian model and see what happens. The Gaussian model is that y is a high dimension vector with covariance, say, ky. Let's simplify notation and make the mean zero. We generate Gaussian randomness. This is very standard in Gaussian. Let's just do that. So we have x to be normal with 0 with identity k. k is the dimension of the generated randomness, x. And typically, k is less than d. OK? So you generate low dimension randomness. And we're going to put a constraint on the generator to be of low rank. In other words, the rank of the generator there should be k. The observed data is in d dimension, typically larger than k. So this is our setup. Okay, so we have a quadratic Gaussian, we have our model, and now we can prove theorems. 
and our theorems will describe the behavior of guns on this model. Okay, the first question we have is just to remind you, I have a normal zero lambda. Sorry about that. The notation has changed already from one slide to another slide. It shows you how recent this piece of work is. We still haven't figured out our notation. Uh, lambda, covariance lambda, it was ky before my mistake, sorry. This generate a bunch of data, the yellow points. I'm trying to generate images which are low dimensional samples on this red low dimensional space to approximate as good as I can this distribution y. So the, the first question one should ask for any statistical method, because GANS is after all a statistical method, is what? Is what happens when n goes to infinity, when you get more and more data. Okay, any guess? What is the limiting performance, or what's the, what does GANS become as n goes to infinity on the Gaussian model? What is the, what is the most, what is the oldest supervised, unsupervised learning problem? Method, unsupervised learning method. PCA. So this converges to population KPCA, where K is the dimension of the space. So it is a y hat converges to a Gaussian distribution with covariance exactly the top k principal components of lambda. Okay? So this is the KPCA. So Gans gives us KPCA, which is reassuring because if it gives us something crazy, then you're a little bit con worried. Because after all, KPCA is the most, probably longest history and supervised learning method. So when K equals D, but in particular special case, then this whole thing is just like lambda, the covariance. So GAN, that means implies that GAN is consistent. So good. So at least our statistical procedure GAN is consistent. That is, as you get more and more data, you converge to the true thing. Okay. Now, once you get the convert limit, then what's the next question? How fast you converge the limit? In other words, what's the generalization ability of GANs? And then we have a result. The rate is n to the power minus 2 over k, where n is the number of samples, k is the dimension of the space, the generator space. Okay? Is this fast or slow? Let's calculate. Suppose k is 16, which is a very common number. And I want this number to be, say, less than 1%. Uh, I don't know if there's any extra zeros here, uh, Paul. <laughs> but it doesn't really matter because it's just a lot of zeros. OK? All right. So the convergence rate is very slow. Very slow. The number of data points you need is uh, exponential in k. Now, OK. So now we have a trouble because GANS is a so it's an exciting technology. But the theory is not working out. The theory is not working out. So what's going on? Now, you can say, is this a limitation? Is this a fundamental limitation? Shannon always teaches us to ask the word fundamental. Sounds like some religion, some religion or something. But uh, is this a fundamental limitation? Or is this something wrong with GANs? Well, actually, there's a very simple solution to this problem that has been known ever since Pearson, who invented PCA which is basically empirical PCA, right? You just take your data and you calculate the empirical covariance matrix and you use that to approximate your PCA. And this, of course, will also converge to the population PCA as you get more and more data. The convergence rate here is much faster. Basically, you only need the number of data to be roughly slightly larger than the dimension, K. Much, much faster. So GAN is actually doing a very bad job of solving a very simple problem. OK? All right? Uh, but we're not content. OK, so we're not content with negative results. So we want to have positive results. But to get positive results, we need to understand why there's a negative result here first. So why poor generalization? So let's look at a picture. So let's assume D equals K, the full dimension. 
Okay, and this is our architecture. All right. So this is my data in high dimensional space D. I generate a bunch of remnants, which is in low dim in, in the same dimension, D equals K. Now I allow any generator, suppose. Then the generator will generate a bunch of guys, and the optimal generator to completely make the discriminator completely confused is basically to make these points the same as these points. Okay? That requires a very rich generator, but since we don't have a constraint, so let's go with that. Okay, so basically the question of generalization is to understand that the optimal generator distribution is exactly equal to the data. Well, this is not a very interesting learning method because it's memorization. You're just memorizing all the images you've seen, and when someone asks you, give me a new image, you just generate one of the ones in your memory. But this is what it does without constraint. Okay? All right. Now, once you do that, then you realize that the distance between the true distribution and your general distribution is the same as the dis dis distance between the true distribution and n samples you draw from that distribution, qy. So q is empirical, p is true. So this is the picture. This is the true distribution, a Gaussian distribution, and this is the data you draw from this distribution, n of them. OK, what does a transport mean? Transport means that you take these points, you put it here, and you try to move the mass of your distribution to these points. That's what transport means. Now, now we put back, a, and at this point you say, hey, this guy David Shea is supposed to be doing something good in information theory. Never mention a single word about information theory, actually. I think you invited the wrong guy, I think, Paul. Um, but at this point, I want to save my uh, reputation. So now I would like to put in some information theory thinking. What information theory problem does this remind you of? You have a distribution, you have a bunch of points, and you want to measure sort of how much it costs to move stuff from this continuous distribution to these points. Quantization. Indeed, this problem of optimal transport is very intimately related to the problem of optimal quantization. And we know from quantization theory that to get a certain distortion, the number of points you need will have to grow exponentially with the dimension of the data, dimension of the distribution. That is the problem. That's why W2 guns, W2 guns, or any guns, not generalizing very well. Because you basically have to quantize. And to quantize, you need exponential number of points. OK? So that's bad. And actually, we, in a, in a direct, different direction, we connected this problem to a rate distortion problem, and we're able to work up exactly what's the rate of scaling you need for a given distortion. Uh, but that would take us too far, and I would just stop there. And if you have any interest, we can talk about that offline. But now, we have a problem because the number of data points is growing exponential indeed. And this will take me many, many years to learn a Gaussian distribution. That's a bit sad, isn't it? But in practice, this is not happening. In practice, they're learning these beautiful images, generating these guys. What's going on? Well, one thing is that uh, we have to perhaps constrain the generator. Because in practice, Gans is constraining the generator to be some neural network, some, not some arbitrary function. Maybe that will help us in generalizing. In fact, in our supervised learning thinking, we know that constraining the predictor class will help us improve generalization ability. Will it help us here as well? So now, what is, so can I get some suggestion from the audience? What is a natural class of generative constraint for the Gaussian problem? Neural network? Do you want to use neural network to solve a Gaussian problem? I know neural networks are very powerful, but uh, maybe this is a, uh, overpowering, linear, right? So let's constrain the generator to be linear, okay? So linear generators is a much, much more constrained class compared to arbitrary generators, even compared to neural networks. 
So you hope that you have good generalization ability. And because we're doing KPCA anyway, we want to do KPC anyway, so the linear generator will achieve the limit. So we're not losing in terms of our limiting performance. What I hope is we get much, much faster generalization ability. The answer is disappointing. We still get exactly the same rate of convergence as when there were no constraint. So constraint the generator is not helping us. What's going on? Well, basically what's going on is that our, our discriminator, our architecture, is basically trying to solve this problem. You give me an empirical distribution for the data QY, your true distribution PY lies in a ball which is very far away. Going, this converges very slowly. This is in Wachenstein space, or everything is measured in Wachenstein distance. Okay? And now, as long as your generated distribution has a lot of guys in this ball, there's no basis for you to choose which one. Because your resolution on the Wachenstein space is very bad. So having generator constraint doesn't really help you unless you constrain it so much that there's nothing left, but usually there are a lot of stuff around. So constraint generator doesn't help. Okay? Now, there are two things to constrain. If I constrain the generator doesn't help, then I should constrain the discriminator. So what does that mean, constraint discriminator? Okay, so this is my discriminator from the Kontorovich dual for the W2 quadratic Gans problem. It is in terms of convex psi, right? But you may say, hey, wait a minute, in practice we don't have convex psi, we have actually some deep neural network, right? So maybe if I constrain the psi further, then the generalization ability will improve. That's our last hope at this point, guys. Last hope for Gans. Okay. So this constraint is coming from the theory without any implementation constraint. So now the hope is if I constrain the discriminator, then I will get faster convergence. But now we have to be careful because if we constrain the discriminator, then the whole optimization problem will change. And now maybe the limiting solution will be wrong. So even if I converge very fast, I may converge to the wrong thing. And that's essentially what Aurora did. There's a paper by Aurora who basically said that if I constrain discriminator, I get fast convergence. But it turns out to be converging to the wrong thing. Okay? I shouldn't make fun of him here. But uh, that's what happened here. So we are, more we are a little bit more ambitious in the sense that we want to be still converging to the right thing and converging in the right metric, that is W2, but much faster. Can this be achieved? Can this be achieved? To achieve that, I need to properly constrain discriminator. In other words, I want to constrain discriminator such that the population solution, the limit, the PCA solution, remains the same. Remains the same. Do not change it. So this, we needed to draw on a theorem from optimal transport theory, which tells me what's the optimal psi in the dual problem. So there's a dual problem for the quadratic Gans. This is the optimal psi, and in the population limit, it turns out that the gradient of psi optimal in the dual problem must satisfy this relationship. That is, operating on y must match y hat at optimality. Okay, from this equation, actually, this tells us something about what, psi, what class of psi can I constrain and still I achieve this condition. So think about it. Y is Gaussian. Y hat, since I have linear generator, is still Gaussian. And the gradient of psi equals Y hat. So the question is, what must psi satisfy? Well, this is Gaussian, this is Gaussian, so this function should be linear. The gradient of something which is linear, that means that something must be quadratic. So in other words, if I now add a further constraint of quadratic combined with convex, which means a positive definite A, I will still be unchanged population solution. 
And so now I have a quadratic gas with a further constrained quadratic discriminator. So this is my architecture, general side. Now I further constrain it to be quadratic and I get it into this very nice quadratic discriminator. Okay? So this is my final architecture. Linear G, quadratic discriminator. And the final theorem is that I finally get back empirical PCA. And I have very fast convergence because I know empirical PCA has very fast convergence. Basically because this quadratic says that only the second and first moments matter. I should not look at too fine details about what the data points is. So this is a very complicated solution for empirical PCA. But this is only a demonstration, it's a non-trivial demonstration that GANs can actually achieve empirical PCA. It's not obvious. But this is teaching us a lot of stuff. I, we have a reviewer. This paper is submitted to Machine Learning Journal. They have open reviews. Everyone can review. And the reviewer says, one reviewer says, these guys are stupid. There are no neural networks. Why is this guy writing a paper on GANs without any neural networks? Okay, so that's it. I leave it at that. <laughs> I leave it at that. So I summarize. We are looking at a paper, at a work, GANs, done by this very creative guy. Look at him, 20 something years old. To solve this problem, we need to bring in the connection with supervised learning, started by Lagrange and Gauss. This leads us to optimal transport, Monsch and Kontorovich. In the special case, we connect the PCA Pearson. And finally, to understand generalization, we had to think in terms of rate distortion. All these people is an amazing story. Thank you. So I should say one thing I forgot to say, which is I'm really honored to be here, in particular because this lectureship was uh, endowed by Jack Wolf. And I've known Jack Wolf for many years at Qualcomm. We were already working together. And I really missed him. So really honored to be here. Okay, well, uh, thank you for a beautiful talk. Are there any questions for David? Yeah, young man. So, I mean, I have a couple of technical questions, but I, I think I can defer them to the offline session. Okay. But, I mean, you know, I'm probably asking you to reveal the magician's trick, but, I mean, every time I listen to your talk, there is so much clarity, and I believe that you actually didn't think linearly this way, there must have been some process going completely backwards, but in the end, you kind of, you know, <laughs> you know <laughs> made up this story. So for this particular work, I mean, what was actually your uh, direction of thinking reaching to this, you know, reaching this conclusion? Yeah, so the first question we ask ourselves is, we realize that GANS is actually an unsupervised learning method. So that's our first observation. We know that there is a very basic unsupervised learning method called PCA. We asked our question, can GANs implement PCA? That's it. That was our first question. That's a very simple question. I think everyone should ask a baseline question for any machine learning algorithms that people come up with. Can it sort of specialize us into a case that we understand? And that took us a long time to address, <laughs> to get to that answer. It's not an obvious answer. <laughs> Transport, can you reverse it? So that means do you lose something about the power of GANs by posing it in an optimal transport sum? Or can you prove the converse? So, um, yeah, so I don't know how to formulate that question of uh, losing power. I think we are here drawing on the natural form. So at the end of the day is a formulation. Machine learning 
problems, unlike information theory, is often not about fundamental limits, but it's about formulation and how to solve those formulations. And so here we are trying to come up with a natural formulation of GANs. And the way we do it is to draw on a long established 300 year history of supervised learning and connect it to supervised learning. So I cannot prove any converse. So there is a complexity theoretic point of view of limiting the GANs. So that might be able to suppress the converse. Ah, so you have a computational limit on the GANs. Yeah. OK, we have not talked about computational limit. Uh, but the architecture we had for Gaussian is certainly efficient. It's certainly efficient. Yes? Uh, can you be a little bit more specific? Iterative decoding, though, as far as I understand, is not game theoretic, right? It's not. So I'm not sure how I could draw that connection. But maybe we can talk a bit about that offline. That requires probably a little bit more longer discussion. Yes? Uh, so my question is uh, a little bit related to the one before this one. So I do believe that by limiting them to the optimal transform choice framework, uh, it does lose some but uh, I also believe that uh, you can prove your results without using optimal transform, right? Because you uh, reduce it to optimal transform, but in the end, you are not using optimal transform. You are using the um, positive definite matrix. Yeah, but uh, no, but we choose the, so the optimal transport gives us the Kontorovich dual. Kontorov 2 has a very specific structure. And then we look at the optimality of that optimization problem and say that if we limit to quadratic uh, psi, then we don't lose any performance in the limit. So there's a step, there's a sequence of logic to get to that quadratic. Of course, once you get to the quadratic, you can forget about how you get there and just look at that one. But if you look at that one in isolation, I don't know how you would, for example, broaden it to neural networks, how you would uh, think about it by itself and not in the context of this whole theory. Yes, Tara. Sorry, can, can you repeat a question? I didn't follow. Say, like, are there positive results that you would get that would, you know, shed light on examples you didn't know how to solve, right? So yeah. So I think uh, the ne natural next step is to go beyond Gaussian and see what happens. So. Yeah. Can a, uh, constraint set, you define the only way you can define constraints to get the to the empirical PCA, or could they be other pairs of constraints? That yeah, uh, I think this is a very natural constraint. Because once you, basically once you specify the quadratic discriminator, then you can see from the discriminator that, uh, let's look at the discriminator. Oops, oh this is the wrong thing. <laughs> so that's, this is our final architecture. So if you look at the, what the discriminant is computing, it is a quadratic form. That means that all, all, the only thing that matters, if you look at this as quadratic form, uh, is the second moments of y. The second moments of y. So this discriminant becomes basically only dependent on the second moments. And for the Gaussian problem, this is the natural thing to do, because we know that the second moments completely specify this Gaussian distribution. So th I think the fact that it looks at this particular structure, uh, we're trying to understand what it's telling us. Because this structure, 
in some sense, if you think about it, this is like a very complicated way of computing an empirical covariance matrix through a min-max problem, right? But this is what the entire theory is giving us in this special case. So I think it, is, it holds some magic, as uh, you said. It, of course, for this model, no. Uh, if it's not Gaussian, then it's not going to be quadratic. But this tells us that uh, constraint the discriminator is in fact effective. And the question is how you constrain the discriminator in other cases. Okay, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank David again for a great talk. <laughs> and as the uh, Shannon Memorial Lecture, you get a, a beautiful plaque. Oh, thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> and in case you don't know, maybe you don't know either, but that plaque will go up in the uh, Shannon Memorial Lecture Hall of Fame that's in the back of the CMRR auditorium. You get to keep that one, but we make another <laughs> one. <laughs> I thought you were going to give me a statue of myself or something, <laughs> and not to carry it back home. <laughs> that's when you're older. You're still too young. <laughs> okay. Thanks again, Dave. Thank you. Thank you. Can you, uh, there's one more thing we usually do at the end of the Shannon Memorial Lecture, so don't go away yet. Now let's see which is the, uh, the wand. So Jack uh, actually uh, initiated another uh, fellowship, which was a, a prize for uh, graduate students here at UCSD. So it's called the Shannon Graduate Fellowship. And we've been doing this since 2008. And that's the list of winners to date. And so there was a uh, request for nominations that went out. And there was a tremendous response, actually more than we've had in any previous year. So after uh, lots of deliberation and use of neural networks to come up with an optimal solution, the uh, decision on who would receive the award this year was that it would go to Hamed Omidvar. So I'd like to invite uh, Hamed and his advisor, Massimo, to come up and say a few words if you'd like. Congratulations. Sure. So congratulations, Ahmed. Thank you very much. So I thought that maybe I should uh, take one minute to tell you what, uh, what he has done to uh, get this award. So Ahmed worked on a, a field that in mathematics is known as contact processes or interacting particle systems. But what I'll try to do is to tell you um, s what that means without going into the details. So it will be mu much less technical than David's talk. So imagine that you go um, to a cocktail party and there is all sorts of people there and then you start uh, uh, chatting with different people, you move around, you go around the room and uh, you interact with many, many people. And then what happens is that you can observe that over time people tend to cluster together and you end up in groups where you sort of share the same interest. You, you like to be around people that uh, are like you or not like you, but, but are, are pleasant to you in some sense. And, uh, and this is a phenomenon that is observed in the social sciences and in many other contexts. Uh, is studied in statistical physics, is known as uh, spin glasses systems, and is studied in, uh, in economics, is known as the Schelling model. And Schelling actually got a Nobel Prize for, for, for proposing this model many years ago. And until recently, there were no um, rigorous results, uh, so people were able to simulate different variants of this model and observe what, what the steady state of this would become. 
And then a recent group of computer scientists um, uh, was able to, to crack the problem and, and find the, the first rigorous convergence theorems. And here's where Ahmed came in and uh, considerably extended these results and actually gave the first results uh, with high probability for this model, which are very, very difficult. And I commend him for this. And he surprised me quite a few times during the uh, during his research. So that's the best thing for a professor, to be surprised. And so uh, there is also something called the Nobel Prize syndrome. So the, this is not a Nobel Prize, but I hope you don't get the, uh, the Shannon uh, syndrome, which basically means that after doing something <laughs> of, <laughs> of, of, uh, of accomplishment, you, you, you'll stop doing things. I look forward to <laughs> being, uh, being surprised a few, uh, few, few more times. All right, thank you. I just want to thank, thank my advisor for actually being patient with me because I was working on this problem and it, at some point it seemed like it's not getting any result for a while and it was finally cracked at some point and we made some progress. I just wanted to thank him for <laughs> being patient and I wasn't really expecting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. I should mention that uh, you also get a uh, sizable cash award. <laughs> so regardless of whether the Shannon syndrome sets in, you can walk away with something, <laughs> in including your degree. We'll make sure that he gives you your PhD. Yeah. It's actually more than you get, David. I'm sorry. But that's <laughs> <laughs> There's one more thing I wanted to say. I, I mentioned that we had a terrific um, set of nominees. So I really felt it was important to um, to name them, to identify them, and to give them some credit. So here's the list of the other contenders this year. They were all outstanding. I mean, any one of them is deserving of this award. So I don't know if any of them are here. Uh, if you are, would you stand up? OK, great. And I just want to say that you'll be getting a little something too, okay? So we'll talk to you about that later. Okay, with that, uh, we'll conclude the uh, proceedings here. There's a nice reception outside. And thanks again to David and to all of the uh, Shannon Graduate Fellowship nominees and their advisors. And thank you all for coming.